So today we're going to talk some more uh, and um, finish talking about uh, concept learning and machine learning in general and inductive bias. It's the main thing we're going to talk about. And then the remaining time we'll start, off, uh, start information theory. Um, you're lucky that you're here today because this is the only important lecture in the course. What? Uh, if you remember one thing from this lecture, the rest of the course you can go home. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of serious in the sense that the rest is math. Yeah, math is important. I, I love math. But the rest is details. The rest is mathematical detail. The important thing about machine learning, we started talking about at the end of last lecture, and I'm going to continue to talk about today. And that important thing is inductive bias, namely the assumptions you make to reduce your search space. And I'm going to try to convince you that this is really the heart of what makes you succeed or not succeed um, in solving your machine learning problem. So the first point I want to make um, is that we're talking about it in the context of concept learning, which is a very specific kind of machine learning. It's learning a concept, namely a binary function, a binary classifier. But the principle applies equally well and even more important it applies in a more important way to all other problems of machine learning. So that's why I kind of put on the board in my spare time this uh, comparison. Uh, in concept learning, the goal is to find a function from some input space into two categories, zero and one, we call them. Uh, in general machine learning, we said we phrase it as learning a function from some input space into maybe something else. It could be the real numbers. It could be a set of real numbers, and it could be a point in high dimensional space. It could be a set of classes. Um, it could be, you know, any, anything. Uh, we said that if it's a number, it's regression. If it's categories, it's classification. It could be a plan. But the important thing is that we're trying to find a function. In both cases, we have an input space, which could be extremely large. And in both cases, the notion of learning a function, learning is a very sexy word, but really what we mean by this is selecting a function from a potentially very large set. So if, I suspect that if we called it machine selection, uh, it wouldn't attract as much attention in the news. You know, and a famous researcher selected a, a function yesterday to learn uh, blah, blah, blah. We call it learning. Um, but mathematically speaking, it's selection, selecting a function from a potentially extremely large set. How large? Remember how large the input space is? Well, much larger than that. Remember, the function space is always exponential in the input space. We saw that numerically here, 2 to the x, but it's also true here. And what I mean by exponential, the base of the exponent will depend on the output of the function. We already said that the number of functions that are possible from a domain D to a range R is the size of the range raised to the power of the domain. The domain in our case is x, the input space, right? Domain and range is input and output. Hope you know that. Um, so this is x. The range is whatever the output of the function is. If it's a ca classifier and it has 10 possible categories, then this would be 10. What if it's a regressor, regression, and the output is continuous? Then the range has infinite many outputs. Um, and then what is this, how many functions are there? Well, there are also infinitely many functions. But it turns out there are different kinds of infinity. Um, and if the output of the function is, for example, uh, integer, so if you have a function from um, all right, let's make this uh, into this. So the function from integers into Okay, so the domain is integers. 
which means the size of the domain is called Aleph zero. That's the infinity, the countable infinity, the number of integers are, there are, and the size of the range is just two. The number of such functions can be written as two to the Aleph zero. And interestingly, two to the Aleph zero is a bigger infinity than Aleph zero itself. It's a non-countable infinity. So just tuck it away somewhere that not all infinities are the same. And you can create larger and larger infinities. And it's still the case that the number of functions is much larger in some sense than the, the size of the function space is much larger than the size of the input space, even for infinite spaces. The important thing for our purposes is not that it's much larger, is that it's huge. And that for all practical problems, and even for toy problems, um, enumerating this list is almost impossible. And I gave you in your assignment a tiny, tiny problem so that you could enumerate it if you wanted. Uh, but for any real world problem, you will not be able to explicitly enumerate all possible functions. But nonetheless, you are choosing from that set. When you learn, you are choosing a member of that set. Um, and then, because it's so large, the amount of data that we have is not enough to constrain it. And you need to constrain it yourself ahead of time. This is what brings us to inductive bias. Inductive bias is assumptions that you bring to the problem before you saw your current training data. More important than before you saw it is that it's not based on your current training data. If it's based on your current training data, you already started the training. There's nothing wrong with that, but you need to bring other assumptions in from the outside. So I'm here to tell you, here's the most important lesson that I want you to remember from this course, is that you cannot learn from data. I should have started with this, maybe I would have scared away half the class, I'm here to tell you that you cannot learn from data. There's a twist, right? You can learn from data plus assumptions, or rather, from assumptions plus data. The assumptions usually come first. And all of the mechanics of machine learning is about how to combine assumptions and data. Once you choose what assumptions you want to make, how do you represent it in a way that can then be combined with data to give you the result you want? This is how it should be. The way it is in practice is the variety of algorithms and formalisms out there, and each one of them makes some assumptions explicitly or implicitly, many times implicitly. So if somebody gives you an algorithm, a machine learning algorithm, and tells you it's the latest and greatest, um, your thought should be, does it make any assumptions? The answer is almost always yes. If it doesn't make assumptions, you can go home peacefully. It's not going to learn anything. If it does make assumptions, what assumptions does it make? And do I believe these assumptions hold in the domain in which I'm working now? Do I believe these are reasonable assumptions on the, for the problem I'm attacking? So most of the, the critical part of machine learning is the matching of the assumptions or the inductive bias to the domain, to the problem. The rest is math. The rest is um, deduction. In fact, there's a very nice uh, slide in Mitchell's book, or illustration in Mitchell's book, talking about uh, how the inductive bias <laughs> the assumptions of inductive bias, inductive bias assumptions, when combined with data, are actually a form of deduction, of logical deduction. 
So what machine learning algorithms do is they just follow the assumption that you make plus the data to give you what must be true if your assumptions are correct. So in that regard, induction and deduction are kind of the same thing, except induction brings in external assumptions sometimes implicitly. Deduction, it's always very explicit what your assumptions are. How do we bring in inductive um, bias? Uh, there are several different ways. One we've already encountered last lecture, and that is by deciding on a set of functions that we're going to consider. In our case, it was the set of all conjunctions. This is a very explicit and hard way of, of bringing in inductive bias. It's saying, I believe the answer is a conjunction. I don't know what kind of conjunction, but it is a conjunction. It is equivalent to taking the big concept space and circling all the conjunctions, which are a tiny part of it, and saying the answer must be in here. What if the answer is not in there? What's going to happen? Yeah? You're not going to find it. Um, you're going to find it, absolutely. If it's not in there, you're not going to find it. Right? If you make this hard assumption, um, then either you're right or you're wrong. And if you're wrong, you have no recourse within that assumption. So just as an example here, the size of the space was 972, maybe 973 if you include, if you throw in the null hypothesis, and this was huge, it was 10 to the 30. The same thing holds in the general machine learning case, except here it's hard to us sometimes to count it because it's, these are infinites. But I'll give you a feel for it. If you have a bunch of data points, if you're trying to learn a mapping from a number x to a number y, Here's x, here's y. Here are some training examples. Four training examples. Now I'm asking you to learn the general function. How many functions are there from x to y? Of course, infinite, but a very large infinite. You can start making assumptions. What assumptions might you make? I'm sorry? A linear, a linear function. That's a very strong assumption. Um, we can start with that. Let's say we assume it's a linear function. A linear function has two parameters, right? f of x equals ax plus b. So it's characterized by two parameters, intercept and slope. So you boil down the whole problem of learning the function to learning these two parameters. Or in other words, you restricted yourself to the family of straight lines. They could be at any orientation and any height. Any other assumptions, weaker assumptions? I mean, this is, doesn't look like a great assumption for a linear, maybe, I don't know. Just continuous. continuous, yeah, that's an example of a much weaker assumption, but still an extremely strong assumption. The vast majority of functions out there are not continuous. Right? One way to see that is if you say, let's draw an, a, a function at random. How do I draw it at random? For every x, I will draw a random y. Well, it's pretty much guaranteed that you're not going to get a continuous function. So just by assuming that the function is continuous, you're reducing the space significantly. But continuous is still an extremely large space. There are in, infinitely many continuous functions, as there are infinitely many linear functions. Right? So they're all infinite but you're still reducing the space. Can you reduce it further? Can you specify that it's only a certain kind of distribution? Distribution? You yeah. mean function? Yeah, the data that we have is only, can be generated by, for example, a binomial or Gaussian distribution. So the, learning this function is about learning y when x is given, and it's not asking how x is generated. So I'm assuming it's a deterministic function. That's already an implied assumption that I didn't even address. I'm assuming it's a deterministic function, and I'm just asking you to learn that function. No distributions involved here. Yeah? 
You can assume that it's a polo these are polynomial, it's a polynomial function of some degree. Now you have much more choice than if you assume the linear function. It could be second degree polynomial, third degree, fourth degree. Maybe you want to limit it up to some, some level. So there is a whole hierarchy of assumptions that you could make. Going back to, so, so this is true here too. This is the example I was trying to give, is that I put this in quotes because sometimes it would be hard to count. And in the, even in the language of set theory where we count infinities, sometimes the two would have the same infinities. For example, the, the number of linear functions is the same from a set theoretic point of view as the number of quadratic functions. Even though quadratic functions have three degrees of freedom, three coefficients, and linear functions have two. But it's the same kind of infinity. So it wouldn't be mathematically correct to say that the size of the set is larger than the size of, of, the size of uh, uh, all polynomials of set of all quadratics is larger than the size of the set of all um, straight lines. But it is still true in some sense, just not in the set theoretic sense. So we will not use this kind of terminology when we talk about learning general functions. But the principle still holds that we're going to constrain ourselves. The reason I start with concept learning is it's very easy to count what happens there. It's finite, discrete and finite. So let's continue with, with this kind of picture where you have the set of all possible functions, all possible concepts, and we're trying to choose an H. We're trying to choose a hypothesis space that is smaller because I told you and hopefully you believe me that you have to. Now, we have a choice. We could choose conjunctions. They're going to be here. Or we can choose disjunctions. They're going to be equally small part of the space. Uh, and they're actually going to overlap a little bit. <coughs> or we can choose some other subset of the space that could be larger or something like this. We have a lot of choice into how to constrain the space. How should we choose? Should we make our inductive bias stronger, meaning choosing a smaller subset, or weaker, meaning choosing somewhat bigger subset, still small but bigger? What do you prefer, a strong bias or a weak bias? No? Maybe it depends on how much data we have. And Wonderful. We know about the domain. Wonderful. Wonderful. You give me both answers I was hoping for. It depends on how much data we have and on how much we know about the domain. So let's start with the domain. You should make as many assumptions as you feel confident about or comfortable with. Comfortable with meaning comfortable that they're correct. So assume as much as you feel that is reasonable to assume. It's, it's, it's not a mathematical statement here. Um, and of course, you could, it's possible to go too far or not far enough. The second part about the data is the more quantifiable part. The more data you have, the less strong the assumptions you need to make. You always need to make assumptions. You're, it is never the case that you can learn without making assumptions. But the question is how strong the assumptions need to be. The more data you have, the more you can relax things, or more accurately, more importantly, the less data you have, the more you have to assume. So you may start from that. Start with how much data you have and say, oh darn, I have to make a lot of assumptions here. And now you're taking a risk. If you make the wrong assumptions, you're going to lose. Yes? Um, I have a quick question. So if the more data we have mm -hmm. and we, make, we still make strong assumptions, is that like better? Ah, very nice question. If you have a lot of data and you still make strong assumptions, is that still a good thing to do, to make strong assumptions? Any thoughts? Any benefit you get from having strong assumptions and a lot of data? Should you scale back your assumptions? Should you throw out some of your data? <laughs> 
Yeah? You might get some conflicting results. Ah, and what does that mean? Like um, two sets of inputs might give the same. Output. You might get some contradiction or some conflict. That is true. If you make strong assumptions and you have a lot of data, you may see some conflicts or some contradictions. But what does it mean? What should you do in that case? Throw away the conflicting data? Then you can relax your... Then you can relax your assumptions. Then you should relax your assumptions. So, the advantage of doing that is if you have enough data to start contradicting some of your assumptions, now you have some evidence of whether the assumptions hold or not. Right? So the advantage of having strong assumptions and a lot of data is that you can test some of your assumptions. That suggests that any assumption you make, you should, before you make it, you should quickly test it on the data. So why do we need assumptions then, if we can verify them all with the data? I'm sorry? You cannot verify them all. That's right. You can sometimes find that they don't hold but you cannot verify that they hold or that they will hold in the future. So a very trivial example, looking at this, I can say this does not satisfy a straight line. So assuming there's no noise in this data, the assumption of, that was suggested here of consider only linear functions is not a good one. It's not going to hold here. Assuming there's no noise. If there's noise, we need to worry about, you know, maybe it is satisfied, but with some noise. But assuming there's no noise, making the assumption that I should look in the space of linear functions is not a good assumption. Um, maybe space of quadratics is not a good assumption too. But polynomial of degree three will now fit the data very nicely. But so will polynomial of degree four and five and six and seven. So I can use the data to rule out uh, the very strong bias of saying only linear or only quadratic functions. But I cannot use it to decide between other families. There was a question or a comment here. One thing I want to emphasize is that the kind of problem I'm talking about and the need for inductive bias has nothing to do with computational power. The reason when I talk about how big the space is that you start with and that you need to reduce it down, it's not because of computation power. It's not because of the inability to not having enough time to go through the examples. It is a much, much deeper much harder problem than computation. Even if you had infinitely many computers, the problem still remains. It's a question of not enough deductive power, not enough information, not of not enough computation. I tend to think of computing power as, yeah, we'll deal with that later. That's, that's a relatively small problem. Sometimes it's huge, but relative to this problem, it's very small. This is a problem of lack of information, lack of constraints, lack of deductive ability, not of lack of computation. I want to summarize briefly what we did uh, at the end of the last, last lecture. We dealt with the famous enjoy sport problem, and we made a particular inductive bias assumption. So this is enjoy sport. X was of size 96, C was of size 2 to the 96, which is about 10 to the 30, and H was space of all conjunctions, 
all functions. And we also allow the null hypothesis, what I call the couch potato hypothesis, where you say no to every possible day. And the size of H was 973. So from our very large space of C, we identified H. I'm going to draw it a little bit bigger. But actually, in reality, it's a tiny fraction of this space. It's not as big as it appears. This is going to be my H. And now we were left with the problem of searching this space. That had a relatively small number, you know, 900 and some hypothesis, and finding the one hypothesis, or at least one hypothesis, that agrees with our training data, or another terminology that is consistent with the training data. And there are several ways of doing that. Perhaps the simpler way of doing that is the one I introduced at the end, which is the exhaustive enumeration. Namely, represent each one of these functions explicitly, keep track of them, keep a list, go through your training examples, and for every training example, check which of these hypotheses agrees with it or disagrees with it. And if it disagrees with it, throw it out from your list. And keep going through all your training examples. At the end, you're left with a small set, well, maybe small, we'll talk about it in a minute. You're left with a set that, by your process of elimination, is guaranteed to agree with all your training data. How do you choose from that set? How do you choose the, your final answer from that set? We call these version spaces. So version space starting with H and the empty set or the null set, no training data, no training data. is just H itself. And then the version space of H with the first training example is smaller than H, hopefully, because you eliminated some things. And then you have two training examples and so forth. As you go through your training examples, D1, D2, D3, through Dn, as you go through, the, through them, you get rid of various parts of, various members of this set until you get to the end of your training examples and now you're left with a set that survived at all. Any member of this set is in some sense equivalent to any other member. You don't have reasons to prefer among them. What do you do? <coughs> yeah? Make more assumptions. Make more assumptions. That's good. Get more data, that's good too. So you can make more assumptions, you can try to get more data. You can just close your eyes and pick one at random. Yeah, could do that. What else can you do? How about keep them all? You could keep them all, and you can just be honest and say, these are all equally good answers, and I'm not sure which one of them is right. Then there may be a new instance, and you need to make a decision on that instance, and you can take a vote among them. Now, you might be in a situation where you have, say, 10 hypotheses that survived this elimination process, and you keep all of them, and then you have a new training example, and you take a vote, and nine of the 10 vote yes, and one of them votes no. So you may feel somewhat confident to bet on yes. But you may be in another situation where five of them vote yes and five of them vote no, in which case the honest answer is, I don't know. Right? So yes, we set out as a goal to find one function, but keep in mind we can relax the goal. We, can, we still did something useful by narrowing the field down, first from 2 to the 96 to 973, and then from 973 to 10. That's still progress. And if these 10s agree with each other completely, if 10 of them say yes and zero of them say no, then you're happy. You don't need to choose among them. Um, you can still provide a confident answer. Yeah? So if we take the voting resolution, then the classifier that we have isn't a conjunction any longer. Wonderful observation. 
when you are willing to um, give as your answer the vote of a set of classifiers, then the function that you are giving as an answer effectively does not, is typically not, and does not have to be one of the members of the original set. So in our case, the set is a set of conjunctions. And um, you go through the process and you're left with, say, 10 conjunctions. And now instead of choosing one of them as your answer, you're saying, anytime you ask me, you give me an input, the way I will produce the output is by taking a vote among these 10. Let's say 11, so that the vote is always decided. You are effectively implementing a function, the majority function among those 11 uh, conjunctions. That majority function is itself most likely not a conjunction. So in a sense, you have done the opposite of what I've argued for you to do. You've enlarged the space of solutions that you're willing to consider, because you're now long considering something outside H. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? It depends. Um, it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to find the true, the one true function, as you know, a scientist might have a goal of understanding the underlying mechanism and therefore tr explaining it, finding a true crisp answer, then maybe it's not such a great thing because the kind of functions that you can express by, by taking a vote is a little fuzzier and harder to, to enumerate and understand. If your goal is to maximize the chance that you give the right answer, then maybe it is the right thing. These are somewhat different goals, and we'll come back to that. Uh, this is a problem the statistics has struggled with before machine learning existed. What is your goal, to explain or to predict? And they lead to slightly different answers. Thank you. Yes? As the divergent space is meant, is a general concept, not just for conjunctions? Um, it is. Uh, although uh, it is not used commonly except in discrete, you know, spaces. Um, yes, you can think about it as an intermediate step. If you think of machine learning, the process as a deductive process that starts with assumptions and adds data to it, and then with these assumptions plus this data, what, what is left you can think of version space as start with assumptions and add one data item at a time and check what's left. So the, the one method of, of going through the hypothesis space that we discussed now, I call it exhaustive enumeration or explicit enumeration. version spaces. It is not specific to the space of conjunctions. You can use it on a different H, H of disjunctions, or you can use it even without making inductive, uh, any inductive bias decisions. So you can use it in the big C if you, if you have a computer that's large enough to hold all 2 to the 96 possible concepts. So the question of how you go through them is independent from what, what H you choose. There is an alternative way of going through them, and that's represented by the find S algorithm that we discussed in class. The alternative way is somewhat more maybe heuristic, you would call it, or certainly um, lightweight. You don't hold these huge lists. What the alternative way is doing, uh, in the case of this H conjunction, is you pick one member of the set, and you hold on to it until the data tells you that you can't hold on to it anymore until and then you reluctantly move to a different member. Okay? What does FindS do? It starts with the most specific hypothesis, the null hypothesis, and then it holds on to it for as long as it can, namely until it finds the first positive example. Once it has a positive example, it modifies its working hypothesis to allow that positive example to be classified as positive. And then it keeps going through all the positive examples and it relaxes the conditions by turning them into question marks, into don't cares, so that it accommodates all the positive examples. I don't know what to call this process in general, but uh, you can call it, um, you know, a working, 
a working hypothesis. The concept of a working hypothesis means something that you hold to tentatively. You realize you might have to change it, but if the game ends right now, this is your answer. And then you keep changing it as you need to. When we did this with the find S algorithm, first of all, you don't have the problem of being left with a large set and having to take a vote or to choose among them. Right? You've already chosen among them. How did you choose among them? In the case of find S, you chose the most specific one you could, the one that was as lazy as possible, that said no to as many things as possible. Right? This is another kind of bias. This is another assumption. It's also inductive bias, but of a different type. So we encounter now two kinds of, two ways of implementing bias, so two ways of bringing assumptions in. One is a very hard kind of bias. You set boundaries, you're saying, I'm only going to consider conjunctions. I am not going to consider anything that's not a conjunction or the null hypothesis. You make an exception for the null, let's say. So that's a hard bias. This, this kind of bias is hard bias. This working hypothesis bias is a softer kind of bias. It's a relative bias, so it's a preference bias. Among all the functions that are still allowed by the data, that are not contradicted by the data you've seen so far, Choose the one that is most specific. Or you could choose the one that's most general. Or you could choose the one that has the fewest um, conjuncts. I mean, you can, you can make any assumption you want. But the idea is you introduce some kind of ranking of the hypothesis. And you choose the one that's ranked the highest among the ones that are still allowed by the data, that still have not been contradicted. So you can call that. A soft bias, soft bias, or a ranking bias, or a preference bias, the hard bias uh, is usually brought into the picture in um, one of several ways. One is to explicitly say, I will only consider polynomials of this degree, or I will only consider conjunctions. Another one is to represent your hypothesis using a language that allows only some things. Uh, so if I say, let my hypothesis space be f of f of x equals a1, uh, a0 plus a1 times x, plus a2 times x squared, I'm implicitly saying that I will only consider quadratic functions. I'm saying it through my representation. So by creating a representation for your functions, you are usually introducing a hard bias. Anything that cannot be, any function that cannot be represented using the language you chose for representation is implicitly thrown out. For this reason, hard bias is sometimes called the language bias or a representation bias. So hard, I, I like to call them hard and soft, but I don't think these terms are, for example, in Mitchell's book, he calls them preference bias versus representation bias or restriction bias. He has a variety of other names. The distinction is important because if you make a mistake here, you're doomed. You will never find the right function, even if you have as much data as you want. If you make a mistake here, it's not so bad. Because that means you rank things, you prefer things in the wrong order, but with enough data, you will get rid of the things that are above the correct answer. Eventually, you'll get to the right answer. <laughs>
One more comment about the term bias. The, the word bias, uh, the term is used heavily in statistics as well. I don't know if I mentioned that last time. Um, it doesn't mean the same thing. Uh, bias in statistical estimation is related to inductive bias, but it's not quite the same thing. Um, one way to see that it's not the same thing is that in statistics, you usually prefer to not have bias. An unbiased estimator is preferred to a biased estimator. Whereas in machine learning or in inductive bias, you want to have a bias. No, no inductive bias means no learning. Going back to our example, I just want to help you paint in your mind a picture of two kind of somewhat orthogonal issues. One of them is the bias, or the inductive bias you're inducing, um, it could be a strong bias, so for example, conjunctions, or it could be no bias, if you, if you don't want to listen to me and you want to try it anyway. So that means here H equals C, where here H is quite small, but smaller than C. Or you can have any other kind of bias. A separate question is, once you made a decision about what kind of bias or whether you're going to have bias or not, how do you do the search? How do you combine that decision with the data? And we discussed two ways of doing that. One is explicit enumeration. Which, by the way, in Mitchell's book is called, I think, list and eliminate. If you're trying to find the equivalence, explicit enumeration, or I called it a working set, a working hypothesis. Which find S was an example of. Now, if you have a working hypothesis, you're introducing soft bias on top of the hard bias. Right? Here we have a distinction between having hard bias or not having hard bias and what kind of hard bias we're going to have. And the search introduces a further preference bias, which is, I think, why this is also known, the soft bias is also known as um, search bias. Maybe it's not known as search bias, but it's an appropriate name. Um, often, the way you search, the your heuristic of searching the, the H introduces its own soft or preference bias. Okay, I hope you heard the word bias enough times today. Um, if you really were hit by a car and couldn't come to the rest of, uh, of this class, that's fine. It's okay with me. You've, uh, you've learned, well, at least you heard, the most important part of what I have to tell you. And that is that you must make assumptions in order to learn. You cannot learn without making assumptions. This is not just a religious conviction on my part. Uh, there are mathematical theorems that show it. They typically go by the term no free lunch. So there is something called the no free lunch theorem that's, that shows there are actually a variety of these theorems, different types of these theorems. But what's common to all of them is they show that what, under what, whatever assumptions you make, if you don't make assumptions in your learning, uh, under, um, I shouldn't say that, under what, whatever setting you have, or any kind of machine learning that you want to do, and that applies to statistics as well. Um, if you don't make assumptions, it's not possible for you to, to always be able to learn if you don't make assumptions. What is possible is if you um, make assumptions and the domain in which you're working, I'm sorry, let me take that back, roll back the, the tape, 20 seconds. You cannot learn without assumptions. You can have an algorithm that appears very successful in real world. And it is very successful. Take deep learning, very successful, does lots of wonderful things. You cannot expect it to always succeed. 
It cannot work for all possible problems in the world. It will work for a small, relatively small subset of all possible. It will learn a relatively small set of all possible problems in the world. The trick is, if that small set is what keeps happening in nature all the time, then you found a good algorithm. So we will talk later about you know, problems that come from nature, what assumptions can you make about them? And maybe deep learning is making the right assumptions for problems that come from nature. But if somebody gave you an algorithm and says, this algorithm can learn any function, send them to buy a bridge. Don't talk to them or talk to them, but not about machine learning. Okay? There is no algorithm that can learn all functions. So this is the flip side of what I said earlier, that for any particular function, to learn a particular function, you need to make some assumptions, and they'd better be the right assumptions. The flip side of it is if you have an algorithm, somehow you give an algorithm, it makes some assumptions. That means it can learn some functions, but not others. Obviously, it can learn those functions for which the assumptions hold. <coughs> I'll write that on the board. It's actually multiple theorems. In your assignment, I'm asking you to do some of these things. One of the most interesting things I'm asking you to do is this. Try not to believe me and don't make any assumptions. Allow all possible functions because you cannot explicitly enumerate 2 to the 96, a space of 2 to the 96, I created a smaller problem for you that you can explicitly enumerate. And I want you to explicitly enumerate it under assumption of no bias. And you're going to have a version space, and it's going to shrink, and then you're going to be left maybe with some assumptions, and you're going to take a vote. And you'll see what happens. Question, suppose you made a wrong assumption and you went with uh, explicit enumeration with version spaces. What will happen to your version space? Whether you started with a, uh, let's say you did start with strong bias, so you're here. Let's say you're here. You started with a strong hard bias, but it was the wrong bias. Let's say your function cannot be represented as a conjunction. You started exposing it to data, and you eliminated the functions that are inconsistent with it. What will happen to the version space? Come, uh, empty space? It will collapse to null. It will become an empty space. That's right. So if you go through the explicit enumeration, and you track your version space, and it becomes null, empty, the conclusion is either there's error in your data, or you made a wrong assumption. Any more questions about machine learning in general, concept learning? Yes? Um, so you just said that for the find S method, it's actually, um, first it's like soft bias, and then it comes to hard bias? Or it's the, the other way around, yeah. Sure. I said that when we use the find S algorithm, we use two kinds of bias. We first applied hard bias and then applied soft bias. The hard bias was applied when we chose the space H. By, very ch by the very act of choosing it and not considering anything outside it, we're applying hard bias. And then within that space, we chose to start with the most specific hypothesis. And if we didn't have any data, that would be our answer. Why? Why that answer out of all the possible answers in H? That's a soft bias. We ranked all the hypotheses within H by how specific they are, and then we gave the most specific one that's still consistent with the data. That's a soft bias. Oh, wait. So 
What is the definition of self-bias? Definition of self-bias is a preference. It's not a hard decision. I will not consider these. I will only consider those. It's a, it's a preference of saying within the set that I'm willing to consider, uh, if they're all um, consistent with my training data, I will give as an answer the top one in my list. I have a preferred list. I have a ranked list. And I will keep on it only things that have not been con contradicted by my data. And then when it's time to give my answer, I will give as my answer the top one. Compare that to the method of voting. So these are two extremes. In one extreme, you just take one member that you chose from the outside. In the other case, you give everybody equal vote, right? You can imagine something in between, a weighted vote, where you believe some things a priori are more likely than others, and you take a weighted vote among all the members that remain in your set based on how much you believe them a priori or how much you like them or anything like that. Let me move on because I want to start with information theory. We can talk after. Um, so let me move to information theory now. Um, this is not usually part of machine learning course. Uh, I just think it's really important and so I kind of introduced it, and uh, I, I think it is discussed in other courses as well, maybe not as, as early. Um, the reason I like to introduce machine learning is because I find that, um, introduce information theory, I'm sorry, is that I find that uh, I like to think of machine learning more in terms of information theory than in terms of statistics. You can think of both. You can think of machine learning through the lens of statistical estimation or through the lens of information theory. I think it's useful to know both. Sometimes one makes more sense than the other. Um, the difference is statistics is taught in most college undergraduate educations. Almost everybody has a course in statistics or at least probability theory. Uh, whereas information theory, uh, for whatever reason, is mostly taught in engineering schools but not outside them. So most, most undergraduates come out of their undergraduate education not having studied information theory, and I think it's a shame. I think it's a fundamental theory that everybody needs to know. Um, it's a relatively young field. Uh, information theory was basically invented uh, in the late 1940s. So what are we talking about, 70 years ago, 70 some years ago? Uh, no, less than 70 years ago. Um, late 1940s, invented by one particular person, Claude Shannon, an American um, scientist who worked for Bell Labs for many years. Um, go back in your mind to what you know about the 1940s. Uh, it was a period of tremendous uh, technological growth in communication. Telephones, telephone networks were spreading throughout the country and internationally. Um, and the kind of issues that they had to deal with had to do with how do you transmit information or transmit bits or communication from one side, from one place to another uh, through physical medium uh, that uh, can be noisy. So there's noise in the communication and some of it is corrupt. Sometimes it can get corrupted. Um, if it's voice communication, uh, it can become in unintelligible. So maybe you want to communicate um, in discrete units, like in bits, but bits can be corrupt too. They can get flipped from zero to one and one to zero. So some channels of communication have more capacity, uh, more, are more prone to errors, and some are less prone to errors. So you can think of those channels as transmitting information, transmitting bits from one side to the other, but having some probability of corrupting those bits, of flipping those bits. Some of them have a higher probability than others. Uh, and at the same time, you can think of each channel as having uh, a limited capacity, how much information can flow through it per unit of time. These are all very real world kind of problems that they had to deal with. You know, what size cable should they put between New York and Chicago? You know, how much communication is there going to be and what quality of communication? And, um, and um, 
the, the problems were, were very important, they were in the air, but there was no underlying theory to ground them in. And Shannon is the one who stepped forward and created this theory, and it was one of the situations where once somebody creates it, everybody realized that it was missing and that uh, it's, it's extremely fundamental and useful, but until he actually created it, you know, people were kind of struggling with these concepts. So, why is, um, I, I hope there is an E here. I hope I'm not screwing up his name. There is? Okay, good, thank you. Um, why is information theory important for machine learning? Because until now we thought of machine learning as learning a function from x to some y. Information theory um, suggests that you think about it not as learning a deterministic mapping, but as using x to get as much information about y as possible. So we're not going to look at it as in this binary world of either you know y or you don't know y, but we're going to look at it as before I saw x, I have some uncertainty about what the value of y is. And after I saw x, my uncertainty is hopefully going to be reduced, not necessarily to zero. So I will not necessarily know the final answer, why, but I will know more about it. I will have a better idea. So we need to quantify these notions of uncertainty so that we can measure when our uncertainty is reduced. But you can think of the statistical or the old uh, version of machine learning as demanding that the uncertainty is reduced to zero. Information theory is saying, no, it doesn't have to be reduced to zero. It just has to be reduced as much as possible. So we need to deal with with this notion of what is uncertainty uh, and how do we reduce it. Um, in fact, we can think of the notion of information. We can equate it to reduction in uncertainty. This is how we're going to define what information is. One of the most important contributions that Shannon made was to make a draw a distinction between information and knowledge. What we mean by that is information, he defined it as knowing which of several options happened. If, if there's some uncertainty about what might happen, you know, the Cubs are going to win or the Red Sox are going to win? Are they playing the same game? Um, I don't know. Team A, Team B. I don't know much about sports. Um, team A or Team B could win. There's some uncertainty. Once the game was played, we know which one won. The uncertainty disappeared. Shannon's point was that this situation or the situation of we don't know if there's going to be nuclear war tomorrow or not. We wake up tomorrow and we know whether there was nuclear war or not, if we wake up. Um, from, from information theory point of view, there's no difference between the two. You have two outcomes. One of them is going to happen, you don't know which, and then at some point you find out which. The difference between a friendly game and nuclear war is huge. That's a difference in the knowledge part. From an information point of view, they're viewed the same way. They're viewed mathematically the same way. So his contribution was to say, let's ignore the content of the messages and look only at how likely they are and how much uncertainty we have about which of them is going to happen, not what they mean. Okay? This is the view we're going to take here. We're going to look at the likelihood of each thing happening, not at what this thing is. So, Going back to the definition of information, um, if I have a fair coin in my hand, 50-50 chance of landing on head or tail, and I'm about to flip it, I have some uncertainty about whether it will land on head or on tail. Once I flipped it, once I did the experiment, it landed on one of them, 
I no longer have uncertainty. So with regard to this experiment, my uncertainty dropped down to zero. Now compare that to a die, which is a singular of dice, a six-sided die, you know, you use in, the, in a board game. I'm about to toss it and see which one of the six sides it landed on. Again, I have uncertainty, maybe a different amount of uncertainty. Once I toss it and I observe the result, my uncertainty dropped down to zero again. So if you compare the two, in both cases, at the end of the experiment, I had zero uncertainty. But intuitively, at the beginning of the experiment, you could say that I had more uncertainty in the case of the die than in the case of the, of the coin, because there were more equal likelihood possibilities. There were six here, there were only two here. So intuitively, we want to capture this notion uh, and use it to define uh, amount of uncertainty, how to quantify uncertainty. Realizing that zero uncertainty means that there's nothing left unknown. I want to tie um, one more concept to information, then we're going to start with some equations. And that is a little bit less intuitive. It's called surprise. I want to claim that information equals surprise. Namely, that when do you get information? When you're surprised. And the more surprised you are, the more information you got. It may sound a little weird to start with, but I think it will make plenty of sense. In fact, this is almost a technical term. In information theory, they tend to call it surprisal, not surprise, but it's the same concept. So let me define surprisal. Information <coughs> received um, during an experiment in an experiment. Experiment or observation. It doesn't have to be something that you set out or observation. And it's defined as follows. I for information, O for outcome, specific outcome. This is defined as log of one over the probability that you assign to the outcome before it happened. So we're no longer philosophizing, we're actually writing formulas. Um, question? Uh, that log, base E, base T. Ah, we'll get to that. So first of all, this is the formula, log of 1 over the probability that you assign to something. Now, when I say you, I actually mean you personally. So the first thing to notice here is this is a subjective measure. You might assign one probability to an event, and you might assign a different probability to the event. And therefore, when the event happens, you might be more surprised, you might be less surprised. And the amount of information you get from the event might be different. So information is a subjective measure. It depends on the observer or on the believer, to be more accurate. Now, subjective does not mean it's not quantitative or rigorous. It's very rigorous, but it's subjective. It is a function of the believer as well, not just of what happened. So I'm going to indicate that with a little Q here. And instead of probability of outcome, I'll just call it the Q of the outcome. Q is your subjective belief. So there could be many Qs. Different people would have a different Q's subjective belief. Uh, 
So let's do a quick uh, um, sanity check on some extreme cases. Suppose I believe that tomorrow morning the sun will rise. Okay, this being Pittsburgh, um, I should add the sun will not necessarily be visible, but it will rise. Suppose I believe it for sure, I, I have no doubt. So I subjectively assign it a probability of one. I wait until tomorrow morning, I look out the window, and I convince myself the sun did rise. How surprised was I? Well, I assigned it 1. 1 over 1 is 1. Log of 1 is 0, regardless of base. Log of 1 is 0. I was 0 surprised. Now that makes sense to us. If I was sure about something, then A, I'm not surprised when it happens, and B, I didn't learn anything when it happened. I didn't get any new information. But let's now suppose that I, somebody else believes that the world is going to end tonight. In fact, they are sure of it. So sure that their subjective probability for the event that the sun will rise tomorrow is zero. They go to sleep, they wake up in the morning, the world is still here, the sun is out. How surprised are they? Well, they assigned it zero. One over zero is infinity. Log of infinity is infinity. They're infinitely surprised, <laughs> right? You could also say they got infinite amount of information, but the important thing for us here is that they're infinitely surprised. Moral of the story is don't assign anything for ability zero in your subjective, unless you're ready to live with the consequences. We didn't talk about the base of the log. Um, Here's the funny thing, the base of the log doesn't matter. What happens if you choose one base of the log and then you change your mind and choose a different base? What difference does it make? How does it change the values? <laughs> By a multiplicative constant. So choosing one base or another only changes a multiplicative constant. This is the same as choosing centimeters or inches or meters, right? It's just a unit of measurement. You're free to measure with centimeters or with inches. You can always convert between the two by multiplying by a constant. So this is going to be a convention. Uh, and different fields have different conventions. Uh, we're going to use log base 2, in which case the units are known as bits. In some fields, they use log base E, the natural log, in which case the units are called nats. And in other fields yet, they use base 3. I don't know why, but they do. And in high school, they use base 10. So choose your base, but we're going to stick with base 2. And we love bits. We're computer scientists. So let's do an example. A fair coin. Namely, it has a 50 50 chance of head or tail. Uh, you flip the coin and you got a head. What is the amount of information you got from head? It's log base 2 of 1 over. 0.5. 1 over 0 0.5 is 2. Log base 2 of 2 is 1 bit. How much information would you get if the coin landed on tail? The answer is exactly the same, right? It's also 1 half, so it's going to be 1 bit. So before you flip the coin, you know that whatever it lands on, you will get one bit of information. That's not necessarily the case for unfair coins. But that's the case for a fair coin. What about a fair die? The amount of information you get uh, for any outcome any one particular outcome is log base 2 
of 1 over 1 over 6, which is log base 2 of 6, which is about 2.585, I think, bits. So information theory begins to give us a way to quantify information. Uh, the most important thing you should know about information is that it's ed defined this way, is that it's additive. It's additive in the following sense. Suppose you are observing a sequence of outcomes. You don't know what the first outcome would be, and you don't know what the second outcome would be, and you don't know, you don't know any of them. It could be any sequence. And the sequence can even be dependent, you know, depending on what happened in the first event. Let's say there's a sequence of games. And depending on how the first game ended, it changes the chances for the second game or anything like that. Suppose you have a complex event, a complex chain of events of possible events. And suppose you have your subjective probability assignment to um, each possible sequence. That would be captured by, well, I'll call it Q, sorry, Q of the first event, the second event, third event, let's say just three. These are not th three alternative outcomes. Each one of them is drawn from a set of alternative outcomes. This is the result of the first game, this is the result of the second game, result of the third game. Using probability theory, you can break this down using the chain rule as the probability of event one times the probability you assign to event two given event one times the probability you assign to event three given event one and event two. This is the chain rule, right? chain rule of probability. There is a similar chain rule for information. The chain rule for information says that the information you get from this sequence is the information you get from the first event plus, not times, plus the information you get from the second event, conditioning on the first event have, having happened, plus the information you get from the third event, conditioned on the first and second event happening. Now, strictly speaking, I did not define for you these quantities. I defined them for the unconditioned case. But you can see how that would generalize. The definition of conditioned information E1 condition on E2 is simply log base 2 of 1 of the probability you assign to E1 happening, if, if, if E2 happening, if you know that E1 happened. 2, 1, 2, 1. So it's just a simple extension. So this is trivially derived from this. But the important thing is that you can now think of the information that you get from something as being accumulated. You're accumulating information along the way. And you could calculate the information you get from a complex event by adding up the information you get along the way. And either way of calculating it should give you the same result. So this is very handy for, uh, say, estimating the amount of information you get from some natural phenomena or from, from language or from vision. So let's take an example of language. Suppose you are reading a document and you would like to quantify the amount of information you get from this document. Well, you have to have some model of how the document was generated, which words are more likely in what context and so forth. So this is fairly complex. You can build very sophisticated statistical models of language. But let's build a very simple statistical model of language and use it to quantify the amount of information you get from a document. Let's suppose the document was generated by a monkey that was consulting a dictionary of all the words in the language and choosing at random words and putting them into the document. Okay? And let's say it was a very uh, uniform-loving monkey, so he would choose uniformly from anywhere in the, 
in a dictionary. How much information do you get, I'll call it information based on the monkey model, uh, when you see a word chosen by the monkey, when you know that that word was chosen uniformly from a set of, say, 100,000 words. 100,000 is a reasonable number of words in the dictionary. Um, and the monkey chooses one of them uniformly at random. Well, since it chooses one of them uniformly at random, it doesn't matter which one it chose. Whichever one it chose, the probability of it having been chosen, uh, according to the monkey model, is 1 over 100,000. So this gives you log base 2 of 100,000 which is 16.667 bits. And now suppose that the monkey does that again and again and again, a thousand times, until you get a document of size a thousand. To calculate the amount of information you get by reading this document, or the amount of surprise you encounter when you, when you read this document, all you have to do is add up together the number of bits you get for each word. So you take this 16.667 and you multiply it by a thousand words, and you get 16,667 bits. Now how does this relate to the actual surprise that you experience when you read a regular document written by people? Is the amount of number of bits in a real world document higher or lower than the number of bits here? Lower because you might expect, like if I have the word and, I might expect an else. Right, it's lower because there are dependencies within a real world document. If you have one word, you may expect some other words. That's one form of reduction in, in uncertainty. Any other forms? What about a single word? The monkey generates a single word, you know it's 16.667 bits. What about if the word came from War and Peace or some novel or, or New York Times? Uh, how much, how, mu how many bits are you getting there on average? More or less? Less, why less? You have a smaller vocabulary to choose from usually. Is it smaller? You're saying it's a smaller vocabulary. I would say if it's a New York Times, uh, certainly if it's War and Peace, you have a very, very rich vocabulary. So le let me push back on that. Let's assume that the vocabulary is the same size. It's smaller because once one word uh, appears, there is some relevant word that also that's, that's the point that was made earlier, that there's a, there's a dependency between wor once one, a word occurs and another word. But I'm talking about a single word. So throw away the document. A monkey generates a word uniformly from a dictionary, or you pick out a word uh, uniformly from an article in the New York Times. Yeah? Oh, uh, context matters of like the document. So like, um, if we're talking about world views, we expect a certain like, word to be chosen, but if it's a monkey, we have no expectations for like what type of words to be chosen. So you're saying context matters, and by context you mean how it was chosen with a monkey any word is as likely as any other word. With the World and Peace or New York Times, some words are more likely than others. This is very, very true. It's true for any natural language. Some words are much more common than other words. That creates a skewed, not a uniform distribution. A skewed distribution of words. In fact, a word like the is extremely common. It's about 5% of the English language is the. Whereas some words are extremely uncommon. What does that do to the average information you get? Increases it or reduces it? Reduces it. So we'll come back to that, but the uniform distribution is actually the one that gives you the most information or the most surprise. Anything that comes from a non-uniform distribution would have an average less surprise. See you Monday.